here at CGSR, uh, filling out the end of the season with a flurry of uh, intellectual uh, content for you. <laughs> uh, so uh, yesterday we had uh, Matt Gronig talking about uh, nuclear deterrence, and today we have for you uh, back to the uh, issue of uh, nuclear stability in South Asia, and we have two of the uh, prominent uh, uh, academic scholars who are writing in this field. We have uh, a return visit from our good friend uh, Faroz Khan, uh, who is the author of Eating Grass, the definitive history of the Pakistani nuclear program. Uh, and he uh, has uh, come today uh, to continue the discussion that we started when he was here during his uh, initial book tour. And there were a lot of questions. But since the time of this book, a lot of things have happened. A lot of big decisions have been made, including some that are being announced just this morning. So we have uh, Faroz back to continue the discussion uh, that we started uh, a few months ago. But uh, in addition, we have the opportunity to hear from uh, a younger scholar, Mansour Ahmed, who is a professor at Qadi Azam University in Islamabad a frequent commentator on uh, these issues, uh, and someone who is also working on a book. And why we have both <laughs> on stage together is that uh, we have a little bit of controversy, and that's always interesting for us, right? So when we're sorting out the history of Pakistan's nuclear program, uh, we have the definitive and really only authoritative uh, scholarly treatment of this, and then we have a field that is becoming more diverse, uh, and in fact, Mansour has a different story. No, you didn't quite get it right. <laughs> There's more to this story. It's a little different than you think. And so Mansour has agreed to give us his take. He's working on his own book, uh, and I don't think he would object uh, to me conveying to you that uh, one of uh, the things that shapes his assessment of the program is that he is the nephew of uh, the real, we all think of Aku Khan as the father of the Pakistani bomb, and we think that because he says it. <laughs> well, it's one of those things, uh, success has a, you know, many parents, well, in Mansour's reading of the, the history, uh, the true father of Pakistan's nuclear program is his uncle, Munir Khan. So I think uh, it's just a very interesting set of, uh, of, of uh, circumstances for us to, to try to understand. So with that, I think we're gonna uh, try and do a little give and take. Uh, Faroz is gonna talk first for about 10 minutes. Mansour is gonna talk for uh, 10 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for discussion. So thanks, and uh, Rose? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll, I'll come here. So thank you very much, Zach. Thank you very much, all of you. I'm a familiar face here, so I will uh, I will start straight away on this question. I did not know there was a controversy, so I'm starting standing here <laughs> to, first of all, understand what the controversy is there. Um, for those of you who have read this book, In Eating Grass, in the very preface, I mentioned a name, Mansoor Ahmed, who has been associated with this work, Eating Grass, since 2005 and six. He was very, very young then, and he was a research assistant, providing us all the research book from Pakistan. This book took six years, and he has been very closely associated with me. So therefore, I don't think that, that he doesn't want everything written in this book, but without him, this book would not would have been half complete. So this book is as much written by him as much as by me. So that takes away the first thing from the controversy. <laughs> <laughs> However, uh, the, the, the mention that uh, he's making is that basically, uh, from the very beginning, I think the very first paragraph in the preface I mentioned, that the most difficult aspect of reaching a country's program, especially if it is so controversial, and especially when there are so many, com so many competing narratives, and many fathers, as Zach points out, it was very, very difficult to reach uh, the truth. And by no means, I mentioned that uh, 
in my book that A.Q. Khan was the father of the Pakistani bomb, although that is what is believed in Pakistan to be, to be the ultimate truth. Saying anything otherwise in Pakistan would indicate, would be almost treasonous. It is to that extent. But where I differ with Mansoor probably is that my research, and I've done, done a lot of big spectrum issues, not just the PAC issues, I do not believe that any nuclear program has a single father. And I, I'm not saying this uh, you know, in a pejorative sense. You people are much more familiar with that. The problem was that, um, that uh, Dr. Munir Ahmad Khan's role for 21 years from 1972 till the time he, re he retired was undermined in Pakistan for varying reasons that I mentioned in this book. And what I have urged Mansoor to write in his, whatever he decides to write in his book, is actually to put his life and the Pakistan nuclear program in perspective. A.Q. Khan is the father of Pakistan highly enriched uranium program. There is no doubt about that in my mind. Without him, as my research indicates, Pakistan might not have achieved the centrifuge program to the level that it has reached now. And not only that, if you recall that I talked last time, the centrifuge program actually crashed in 1981, almost bringing it to zero. And from there, to resurrect the program and get it, get a facile material by mid-1980s was in itself a feat that only he could have done that. So he has a place in history uh, which is from a, from a Pakistani standpoint, in contribution to the program, that program, and many other people from Khan Research Laboratory, who were also from Atomic Energy Commission, actually they were sent from Atomic Energy, Energy Commission to KRL, actually told me all this. So therefore, he gets the credit where it is due. But this is also true, which I will, you will hear from Mansoor today, that he claimed a lot more uh, credit than he actually deserved. Taking the controversy of A.Q. Khan aside, which has been so well written elsewhere, the fact is that, uh, that he took credit, a, a large number of credit away from Atomic Energy Commission. And I tried to do justice in this book. And many of the people in Pakistan believe that I have undermined A.Q. Khan's role here, uh, which is nothing to do with Mansoor's reason, but that is just a fact. The history of Pakistan plutonium is not widely known, plutonium production history. The people have generally believed that it is a highly enriched uranium program. From whatever little I know, I have mentioned the beginning of the plutonium production plan that Mansoor may be able to reinforce a little more. But real plutonium production began, as a matter of fact, after 2000 and 2001 and 2002. Uh, the decisions in 98 in tests and in which I was involved and I have memory of that was whether or not we should go for the plutonium route or not. And that was still hanging uh, in 98 and 99 uh, because the Pakistanis said that HEU is a success story and we don't want to start under the program. And remember that the country was under tremendous amount of sanctions and not one layer of sanction, it was two layer of sanctions, which was uh, nuclear sanctions under Prestor amendments and law under the U.S. non-proliferation laws, followed by the military coup that happened in, in 99. So the country is playing with a handicap and large number of Pakistan nuclear policies during the time of President Musharraf before 9-11 was actually affected to mitigate the impact of the sanctions. Well, that changed after 9-11. And from 9-11 until now, is the period where Pakistan has turned its demonstrated capability into an operational capability. My book does not dwell much deeper into this aspect. It talks about in the later part how the operational deterrent was done, but it doesn't go into those details, which I had hoped to actually write another one going forward on this issue. Uh, at the time when actually I retired, Pakistan only had at the maximum, three delivery systems. One was the Air Force delivery system. The second was uh, something called liquid fuel Gori missile, the derivative of Nodong missile. And they had barely tested another ballistic missiles that was uh, 
of very short ranges, Fata 1, 2, and 3 at the time, which was uh, also known as M11 or Ghaznavi. And they were still in the process of getting longer ranges, Shaheen and others. As I speak to you today, Pakistan has now got nine delivery systems, including assortments of cruise missiles, and soon to be introduced sea-based deterrent uh, within next year or so. Uh, the ISR has improved significantly, but more importantly is the plutonium production that have four production reactors, and they have three are functioning to my knowledge, and fourth one will be coming at any time soon. And therefore, there's also some other nuclear energy uh, projects that are now in the pipeline, as you may be well aware. Uh, there is a, a, a Chinese-supported uh, uh, power uh, pr production uh, power reactor in Karachi, which is drawing some bit of controversy from the uh, from the usual pessimists uh, in Pakistan. It's an untested design, and then Pakistanis are and the Chinese are doing that. So there's a lot of controversy over that. From the Pakistani standpoint from whatever exchanges that I've done with scholars in Pakistan since the Karachi uh, power reactor has been uh, inaugurated, they say we've got no choice. We are not beneficiary of a U.S.-India nuclear deal kind, and you already know how U.S.-India relations are spinning now, in what directions. So they say we're not going to get that deal, we know that. So we're going to get the nuclear energy, whatever comes on the table. That's, that's, that's what it is. That's as simple as that. Safety is something back. And by the way, they believe that after Fukushima, everybody has introduced, uh, improved the safety standards. So that is not even a criteria as far as they are concerned. So there we are going, going ahead, Pakistani uh, facile production, Pakistani delivery systems, as well as their uh, nuclear energy is going to go full speed ahead. But the, the, the point that uh, Zach was alluding to that this morning as I was driving here, I learned that my former boss, Lieutenant General Khalid Kidwai, has finally decided to hang his boots and retire this month. So he has been replaced by another serving Lieutenant General by the name of Zubair Hayat, and he is now taken over from him. This is the first time uh, since the uh, Strategic Plans Division was uh, created, General Kidwai has left. One of the problem of this organization was that nobody retired from this organization except me, otherwise I wouldn't be here. So their people uh, have just continued to serve in the same place for 15 years and they have a peculiar mindset that doesn't change and they continue to, to, to drive the program in a certain way. This change is important because this is coming about amid some major political judicial and military leadership changes in the country that has happened within just last one month or so. The Chief Justice of Pakistan, who was very, very, pro very active, has just gone. We have a new Chief Justice. We have a new Army Chief. We have a new Chairman, Joint Chief of Staff. And the political government has just been about six months in Pakistan. So a lot of changes have happened as this year ends. And now we are heading into a new year in 2014 where we have Indian elections coming, and you know, Indian elections uh, is expected to have a new leadership change there by spring. At the same time, we have cha expected change in Afghanistan with Karzai going as well, and another new leadership, uh, the position of US in Afghanistan, and the whole security policy changes of the United States from pretty much focused in this region for the past 10, 15 years, shifting to Asian power rebalancing leaving South Asia onto its own, which actually brings into the question about what Zach alluded to in this, and I've spoken to you at length, and I'll be very happy to take questions on that. The question about deterrent stability in South Asia going forward. With these kind of modernizations that are happening in Pakistan and India, and the implication of introduction of a triad with CBS deterrent coming in, or possible introduction of ballistic missile defenses, and more importantly, uh, from the Pakistani standpoint, which is very, very controversial here, as well as in Pakistan, the introduction of short-range ballistic missile systems, also known as tactical nuclear weapons. I'm using the word also known because Pakistanis don't agree with this terminology. Uh, there are supporters of this, and the rationale will be given, and I'm actually not going to sp speak much because this is where Mansoor and I probably disagree. 
uh, about the implications of uh, introduction of tactical nuclear weapon, whether it has enhanced Pakistani nuclear deterrence or actually reduced is a question in the mind that is debated in Pakistan. Uh, in my assessment, I understand the rationale as to why the Pakistanis introduced this weapon system. I believe that Pakistanis have not truly thought through the implication of actually introducing this weapon system, particularly the areas of command and control, the articulation of command and control and the confusion that it will ensue in the process, the problem of field security once it is out of the storage and into the battlefield, and thirdly, the problem of preemption that, it, that might happen, a war that is supposed to be prevented, it might well even start as a result of its presence in the battlefield. And there are many more implications of that. However, whether this has enhanced deterrence or not, from the counterpart that I hear from Indian at the track two level, it seems to me that the Indians are, they care, they care a damn about the introduction of the system. They're gonna go with their operation plans if necessary, and they're gonna take it out if it comes into the battlefield. And I hear that all the time. And I'm also PIO of several projects that I've done on crisis stability in South Asia. And frankly speaking, I'm not a pessimist by nature, but this does not leave me very confident on the question of uh, stability in South Asia. I'd be very happy to answer the questions on that, but I won't st stay more than this. I like, like Mans to hear Mansoor, and if necessary, I'll come back and speak as well. May I, Mansoor, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zach. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to share my views uh, on a subject which has been controversial for so many decades. And I think controversy is sometimes a good thing because it keeps academics relevant. Uh, and we keep having ideas on doing further research. I'd just like to make a point about uh, Mr. Munir Khan. He was one person who was trained in the United States under the Atoms for Peace program that went to the IAEA, uh, served there for 14 years, uh, and formed an alliance with Mr. Bhutto uh, right after the September 1965 war. So he was appointed as chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission uh, in January 1972. But he never claimed to have fathered anything. He was one person who believed that it was a team effort involving literally thousands of scientists and engineers, and the credit essentially went to the team. And the institution mattered in the end, individuals had to come and they had to leave at one point. Now, without going into details of the controversy with, that he had in, with A.Q. Khan, many of the projects that he initiated, there were over 20 projects uh, in the nuclear fuel cycle, and in the weapon design, development, and testing infrastructure, in addition to the nuclear energy programs uh, that were initiated in the 1970s, uh, later on allowed Pakistan to produce both HEU and uh, plutonium for its weapons program. Uh, the weapon design development program was actually conceived uh, as early as 1972, December 1972, with the formation of the, the, of the theoretical physics group and uh, in fact, Pakistan was well aware of India's work on peaceful nuclear explosives as early as 1971. So as soon as India's test uh, took place, uh, Mr. Bhutto, the Prime Minister, gave the go-ahead to the Atomic Energy Commission to actually start uh, the, the manufacturing and the fabrication work on different elements that go into the making of a nuclear device. Well, there's much more to uh, the history of this centrifuge program. Uh, there's no doubt that A.Q. Khan had a role as a project director in taking the project forward uh, to its ultimate uh, conclusion. But the project itself was uh, confronted with considerable technical uh, challenges. And one of them, as mentioned by Feroz, is earthquakes. Uh, he was told by PAC that they needed to have a raft foundation made for the centrifuges. So he said, well, there are no earthquakes in the, in the Netherlands. So why do we need one here? So in a series of earthquakes from 1981 up till maybe the mid-1980s, 
several thousand centrifuges were destroyed. And that is why I disagree with, uh, with the estimates made by the International Panel on Facade Materials about Pakistan's actual uh, facade material stockpile, especially the HU stockpile. Uh, and now coming back to the plutonium program, which has more relevance on, to what Pakistan is doing today. Uh, Pakistan had actually started working on both routes as early as 1972. The original nuclear plan, which was approved by the Prime Minister um, in May 1972, called for the setting up of uh, fuel cycle facilities uh, that would provide the capability of producing both plutonium and HEU at a later date, initially plutonium and then HEU. And the idea was to acquire these, uh, the technology and the infrastructure through uh, international cooperation under safeguards and then replicate the same outside safeguards for a weapons program as India had done. But right after India's test, this strategy changed. And then the focus was to complete the fuel cycle facilities which needed to be um, put in place uh, as the international suppliers had backed out of all agreements. Uh, so by 1980, the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission had completed over 10 nuclear plants and facilities comprising uranium processing, conversion, uh, this includes the centrifuge program, fuel fabrication, uh, and reprocessing. You're well aware of the French reprocessing uh, plant contract which we had with France and which was uh, canceled under uh, pressure from the Carter administration as uh, late as 1978. And there is no connection between the start of the enrichment program and the cancellation of this uh, French deal. The French deal was designed to be under the strictest safeguards possible, and it would not have been used for the bomb program anyway. The idea was to acquire technology which was acquired in the form of the new labs reprocessing plant even before the French contract was signed in, as early as 1973. So on March, 11th, 1983, the first cold test of a working nuclear device was conducted by PAC. Uh, General Zia had instituted a competition between both labs, PAC and KRL. KRL had separated after AQ Khan took over the project from PAC uh, in 1976. And Zia had uh, have asked AQ Khan to continue to actually start his own work on bomb design based on Chick 4, the Chinese design that Pakistan got uh, as early as 1982. But PAC had a head start of over 10 years in bomb design and was able to carry out a cold test uh, as early as 83. And KRL is also known to have carried out its own cold test based on the Chinese design in 84. Whether those cold tests were, were witnessed by uh, experts or not is not known. Where the cold tests were actually conducted is again not known. But this was a, a backup program in KRL, which was then, uh, where General Zia had then, after Kuldeep Nair's interview in 1987, he had asked A.Q. Khan to stop working on bomb design and development, uh, while PAC was continuing several cold tests. Between 1983 and the mid-90s, they carried out over 24 cold tests of various weapon designs. And at the same time, in 1984, this is a as a consequence of the earthquakes that were happening in Kauta. Uh, Munir Ahmad Khan was able to convince the president that if they wanted to build miniaturized warheads for tactical nuclear weapons, for um, ballistic missiles and aircraft, and possibly thermonuclear weapons, they needed to sanction money for starting an uh, indigenous safeguards-free plutonium production reactor. This is as early as 1984. Now, the plutonium production reactor was conceived actually as early as 1973, but after India's test, the focus had shifted on completing the nuclear fuel cycle. So this project was shelved due to manpower shortages. So this was resurrected in 84, and two new directorates were set up in PAC, the Scientific and Engineering Services Directorate and the Directorate of Nuclear Power. And uh, by the mid 80s, Pakistan had begun work on the 50 megawatt uh, natural uranium fueled heavy water 
heavy water production reactor, plutonium production reactor, along with a heavy water plant and a tritium production facility at the Khushab nuclear complex. Now this complex, if you look at the Google Earth uh, imagery, you'll see that it has, it has a lot of space. The original idea was that this would be an integrated plutonium production complex that would house more than one reactor. And PAC was always calling for plutonium as the first choice because of the advantages that it had in terms of the critical mass uh, and the miniaturization for weapons. And while the French had gone out of the deal, uh, PAC had asked General Ziar to sanction money to complete the industrial scale reprocessing plant, which was half complete as early as 1980, which if, could, if it would have been completed at that time would have been sufficient to provide fissile material equal to 20 kahuta sized plants. But because of bureaucratic politics within the nuclear establishment, that did not happen. So in December 1997, Khushab 1 went critical and new labs that was lying dormant for so many years, it had been completed, the reprocessing plant, the pilot reprocessing plant had been completed as early as 1981. In 1987, uh, PAC carried out uh, reprocessing hot runs using uh, spent fuel from uh, the CANAP reactor under an, an exemption clause of the IAEA safeguard agreement. Uh, this was in, uh, with the permission of the IAEA. So they were ready for reprocessing, but they had not used CANAP's fuel uh, for reprocessing, even when they could have done that for political reasons. As a responsible state, they did not want to uh, break safeguards because that would have carried a lot of uh, diplomatic and political cost for the country. So once Khushab 1 came online, then of course the decision was taken to operationalize the reprocessing plant and the spent fuel after cooling was sent and around 2000 around the, or 2001, the first reprocessing activities started and krypton-85 gas emissions were detected. This is in uh, publicly available literature. So once Khushab 1 was mastered, the technology was mastered, the manpower was trained, then there was a technological pull factor of building other reactors as well. And then came in the Indo-US nuclear deal, that was another factor. But it was essentially the, the nuclear establishment that was calling for more f resources, more funds, and they were they've been uh, able to uh, convince the decision makers that plutonium will help them miniaturize warheads. And the tactical nuclear weapons that you see today is essentially the product of the thinking in the nuclear establishment that was there in the 1980s and the 1990s. And because it offers a military solution in t for the military people, you might disagree with it, it might be controversial, but they see it as, uh, uh, they see value in it that would supplement the deterrence that is already in place. So why is it seen controversial? Well, tactical nuclear weapons were built during the Cold War. It's well known that these weapons did not serve the purpose that they were meant to be for. In the South Asian context, they're even more dangerous because of the uh, close proximity of the two countries. But what choice does Pakistan have? Uh, tactical nuclear weapons are seen to be controversial purely because they're seen as war fighting weapons. Well, I have a slightly different take on that. I think uh, these are, in Pakistan's case, these are only for symbolic deterrent purposes. For the very simple reason that Pakistan cannot afford to go for hundreds of tactical nuclear weapons uh, because of the shortage of fissile material. Pakistan does not have the natural uranium reserves or the facade material production capacity or the existing stockpiles to build hundreds of tactical nuclear weapons for a war fighting strategy. Therefore, the only rational sense therefore uh, for the country to go for such uh, a technology would be that this would add another layer of deterrence. Because of the Indian Cold Star Doctrine, the uh, counter value weapons were seen as ineffective. They had failed to, um, sort of deter the Indians from uh, coming up with a strategy of proactive operations or limited war. Now that brings in the instability, instability paradox, and that's another discussion. But from a Pakistani viewpoint, or from the decision makers viewpoint, they saw this as a ready-made solution. And in, in, in addition to that, it's a technological spin-off of miniaturization. Um, <coughs> Pakistan is building cruise missiles and short-range ballistic missiles. 
uh, and having mastered miniaturization of warheads, uh, this was one way of actually proving to the world that we've miniaturized the te technology for building small warheads. Um, and this is very important uh, because of the evolving force postures. Now, India has a nuclear submarine program. Pakistan does not have a nuclear submarine uh, at the moment, but is known to be uh, working on the naval version of the land attack cruise missile, Babur. Uh, and mo the most likely scenario is that Pakistan will put the ba naval version of the Babur on top of one of the Chinese acquired air independent, air independent propulsion equipped conventional attack submarines. Uh, maybe a 700 to 1,000 kilometer range uh, nuclear tipped cruise missile would be good enough uh, for Pakistani decision makers. Pakistan doesn't need, really doesn't need to go for a nuclear submarine program or a submarine launch ballistic missile program because the resource crunch is there and then it will raise unnecessary eyebrows as well. So now talking of the uh, stability instability paradox and how tactical weapons would actually uh, impact uh, the stability in the region. In my view, I think tactical weapons would only be deployed once a decision is taken to use them. They would not be prematurely deployed. And I'm not a military person, I'm only speaking from an academic viewpoint. But once they are used, that would mean that there has been deterrence failure in South Asia. And then it's, there will be no escalation control beyond that point. Uh, once the decision is taken to use, then it's, it won't just be those small tactical nukes of, of, from 0.5 to 5 kilotons. Then it would be every other weapon in, in the country's nuclear arsenal because the, of the Indian doctrine of massive retaliation. Whether Pakistan uses one small tactical weapon, the Indians will massively retaliate. Now, how credible that is or not is another question. But from a strategist viewpoint coming from Pakistan, I think military sense would, would say that Pakistan would only employ these weapons when the conventional forces have failed to uh, stop Indian aggression. Now, the dilemma is that even small shallow penetrations from a punitive standpoint of a limited war across the international border would be unacceptable. Many of the Pakistani uh, population centers are close to the border and communication centers are close to the border. And if they are breached if, the, if the, uh, the threshold is crossed. Now, there are four, th four thresholds, and they are well known. One of the spatial and the military thresholds would, might be triggered if the Indians are able to uh, you know, even have shallow penetrations in some of those areas. Uh, so in that case, Pakistan would be forced to employ nuclear weapons in the case of the failure of conventional forces uh, uh, deployed at the front. And that would be uh, as a weapon of last resort in case the threat, uh, there is a dire threat to the survival of the country's armed forces or the integrity of the nation state um, in, in the face of external aggression. I don't think any uh, person sitting in Islamabad or Delhi would be so irrational that uh, they would breach the thresholds of either side. Um, and the Indians are uh, saying that they've come up with the strategy of limited war under the nuclear overhang because of uh, uh, alleged Pakistani involvement in terrorist activities uh, across the border. <coughs> now, I don't think two nuclear weapon states should uh, in allow non-state actors to hijack the nuclear discourse in the region. And Pakistan itself is a victim of, uh, of, uh, of non-state actor terrorism. We've had more than 40,000 casualties in the war on terror uh, since 2001. And it, the military has, has suffered, the people have suffered. While it is true that there are elements, uh, non-state actor jihadi elements that were, uh, you know, uh, that were nursed within Pakistan for uh, maybe two decades uh, as part of the Afghan war and the Kashmir insurgency. But I think Pakistan has realized uh, that this strategy was a mistake and is slowly trying to undo the damage that was done at that time. But it is going to take some time before these elements are really uh, taken uh, to task and the ne their network and the support networks are really broken down. And uh, it has to be done in an incremental way, but that should not allow the Indians to actually use uh, uh, as a pretext to launch a limited conventional war that might spiral out of control. So having said that, uh, the next, in my view, the next uh, 
decade and a half uh, would see technological maturation uh, coming in on both sides, uh, both India and Pakistan are moving towards triads. Uh, there are some things that Pakistan is not doing. It seems like a nuclear arms race. In some ways it is, in some ways it is not. Pakistan can go for an ICBM, it is not doing it, it will not do it because it serves no security purpose. Pakistan is not going for a BMD, maybe because of resource constraints or technological uh, hiccups. Um, and uh, Pakistan does not have any EMP program. Uh, Pakistan does not have um, the ability of actually having a blue water navy. And the conventional uh, defense budget, if you see the trends in the last 10 years, is almost static uh, to around four to five billion dollars. Uh, while the Indians have actually been able to uh, raise the defense budget because of their economic potential that they've realized in the last decade and a half. And the presence of nuclear weapons uh, in Pakistan have allowed, has allowed the country to actually uh, keep the defense spending at a certain level. Um, and that I think is one spin off that, and then there is uh, nuclear agriculture, nuclear medicine, there are peaceful uses apart from nuclear energy, which uh, have really contributed to Pakistan's economic development, uh, like nuclear agriculture. It's an agricultural country. Most of the cotton crops, the rice crops are built, uh, have been developed by seeds produced by the Atomic Energy Commission nuclear agriculture centers, and they've helped Pakistan earn billions of dollars every year in earnings. Uh, uh, nuclear energy is another area which uh, was, Pakistan was not able to really harness because of international uh, sanctions. Uh, the only country that came forward was China under the 1986 long-term cooperation agreement, which was before China joined the NSG or signed the NPT. And that's why there's the talk of the grandfather clause. Um, and the Chinese are really the only ones who are willing to sell anything to <coughs> Pakistan. So if there are safety concerns, then uh, the only option is to have uh, advanced more safe reactors from other supplier states, but those supplier states might not be willing to sell the same to Pakistan. So that's a dilemma which a country has to face. So when you're faced with an acute ec economic crunch, then uh, the country will have to uh, really uh, utilize whatever is out there. So having said that, uh, and the final analysis, I think, uh, Pakistan has come a long way in developing nuclear capability. Unfortunately, uh, the illicit proliferation network of AQ Han has uh, tarnished the image of a country which has largely been very, very responsible in its nuclear conduct. Uh, and that was one reason that uh, AQ Khan and Munir Ahmad Khan fell out very early because uh, Munir Ahmad Khan had anticipated that uh, this man is uh, not going to be willing to work under the normal rules. And uh, uh, there were other, there were different approaches of going forward about uh, how to build this capability. Uh, both approaches did succeed in the end, but the other approach, uh, which was procurement heavy uh, in regard to AQ Khan, uh, resulted in the in the um, uh, in the development of an illicit proliferation network, um, which uh, is today uh, a really bad uh, legacy for the country's nuclear program. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mansur. Uh, before we open it up to questions, I thought maybe we would ask Farouk uh, since you mentioned that there were different. Uh, thoughts on the current role of tactical nuclear weapons and their uh, effect on stability. You might uh, fill that out for us a little bit, and then we'll go to sessions. Yeah. Use the microphone so that it goes onto the table. Okay. Awesome. No, I, I don't have uh, very many comments except for the, for the, uh, for just for two comments that I'll make because I'm, I'm more keen to answer the questions that you have. One is about that uh, the beginning of the pr uh, plutonium uh, debate that started after the 1998 test had to do what Mansoor did allude in his remarks. It had to do uh, more with the nature of the program going forward, and especially because by that time it was decided to, to build cruise missiles. And that was a major decision as to why the plutonium route was actually taken. Although the background is what Mansoor has said, and it's also in all these things are also in this book as well. Um, the French reprocessing plant 
that was left in 1978 was restarted somewhere in 1999, 2000, somewhere at this time frame. And uh, actually, it was lying dormant somewhere. And there were bats, you know, all over the place. And it was almost rusted. And they scrapped it all over from the beginning. Now, that's another story that, you know, they had a 100 ton capacity one. Uh, uh, the, the French were ready to give because it was cheaper. I mean, they would have actually, they, they wanted much lesser capacity, the demand in the 1970s. But they said, well, it doesn't make a difference, you know. I mean, it's the same price, go for the 100 ton. So they had, by, 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 so they just had that. And in all that 30 years period that they have had experience of dealing with that, they were ready to start it on its own. So now they have tremendous amount of reproduction capacity in Pakistan now at this point of time. And that explains that it's very hard to say whether it's technology driving strategy or strategy driving technology. My assessment is that it is basically the, the, the technology that is driving and because the military hyphen scientific body is the nuclear bureaucracy that Mansoor has mentioned that drives that drives and strategy it actually follows. Which brings me to the second point that Zach was alluding <coughs> to that. Now, I hear from my colleagues, and Mansoor would also be hearing this, that the idea of introducing a short-range ballistic missile system was basically as a result of a large number of war games, large number of strategic uh, tabletop exercises they did, and a lot of thinking went behind that. Probably that might be true. We have also conducted a lot of tabletop exercises here at the track two level, and Zach and I have been involved very closely. We're going to have another one uh, next year. From our tabletop exercises, and that involved actual Indians and Pakistanis, retired level, very senior people who were there, commandant of war colleges at both ends, and also very senior people, strategic force commander of India and Pakistan, these kind of people have been involved in these war games. And I reached a very different conclusion about what was the thinking behind that. Uh, it is true what the technical reason that Mansoor has indicated, the compact designs and production and then a reprocessing facility that they have. Up until now, to my knowledge, they're still basing on what was the new labs one and two, uh, whatever new labs expanded. So the capacity of petroleum production, to the best of my knowledge, at this point, annimum is no more than 15 to 20 kilograms today. If this thing comes online, then they'll have the reproduction capacity with four production reactors already producing. They will have about 30 to 40 kilograms of plutonium production capacity in addition to the sophistication towards the highly enriched uranium. It's not P2 anymore, it's P3 or P4 as we, as we know now. So with greater SWU output, you're going to have both speeding up the, the production of both HEU and plutonium in the next couple of years. And that is what explains Pakistani diplomatic position in Geneva on fissile material cut off treaty. There's no other reason. This is a straightforward reason. They can always invent all sorts of. That's why the Pakistani public position is somewhat illogical in my assessment. But the real reason is behind is this drive. So they introduced these tactical nuclear weapons because of Indian military doctrine. And actually, the reason that Mansoor has given is the reason that I hear is there as well. Pakistani strategic deterrence of counter-value targeting was insufficient to stop Indian thinking that they can fight a short, sweet little war, start it, and terminate it on their terms and condition. A short, shallow, maneuver limited war under the nuclear umbrella that will be based on calculations that it would not cross the Pakistani nuclear threshold, and that international intervention to stop this war uh, would be you know, precluded till, until the time the military operations uh, are over. And this operation will be fast and swift, anywhere ranging between 72 hours to 120 days. So like four to five days of a very short, intense war would happen on a shallow maneuver that Indian calculated will not cross the Pakistani threshold. At some point, probably during exercises, Pakistanis realize that this may well become true. And that, for a couple of kilometers or sand dunes south of Lahore, they're not going to take down Mumbai. And therefore, they probably felt at some point that their deterrence is not credible. 
that India is ready to risk their major cities to capture 10 kilometers south of Lahore. So they thought that one thing would be to introduce that weapon system into the battlefield, and that will put the fear of God into the mind of that brigade commander who is about to cross the international border, rather than Indian political leadership that would give the decision. And that dichotomy of stability is very, very important. We don't know that. This is what we have been challenging, and that's what I thought. I'll be happy to take questions now on this, but this is where the introduction of tactical weapons actually came about. One last thing that I would say that Indians believe that they can still do it. The Pakistani believe that they have successfully deterred India from thinking on these lines. So therefore, in their belief system as I speak with them, they thought that they have really done the miracle by introducing tactical weapons, and India have been forced to change their military doctrines. It is not any other thing. It's not the political deterrence. It's just the military people will rethink again. I doubt that both sides have drawn very dangerous lessons <coughs> and confidence in deterrence that may actually fall out if it really happens. So that's why I have sound more pessimistic, Zach. I'll be happy to take questions. Questions? One minute, sir. The possibility is minus zero. <laughs> I think after the AQ Khan episode, Pakistan is not going to take any more chances. Uh, there is no, uh, I don't think uh, any rational decision maker in Pakistan would indulge in any such act. Uh, that is why Pakistan is uh, really asking for membership of the nuclear surprise group. Because that would allow Pakistan to import uh, uranium, which would be under safeguards anyway, for its civilian program. Importing uranium, natural uranium, uh, under safeguards would not serve its weapons program. What the Indians are doing is essentially that, thanks to the Indo-US nuclear deal, the, their domestic reserves have been freed up completely to be used for fissile material production, while the same were being used before for feeding the civilian reactors as well. So Pakistan, up as, as far as public information is concerned, has not been really able to expand its natural uranium reserves to the extent that it would uh, actually be able to uh, build a large number of weapons. I mean, my calculations they are that around by 2020, the available stockpiles would allow Pakistan to produce anything between a maximum of 200 or 300 weapons at the most. And this would mean, this would include uh, composite warheads, a boosted fission composite warheads. So uh, that explains the race at Khushab, that we are running out of natural uranium stocks. And uh, before a, a lot of pressure comes in, uh, Pakistan would want to ramp up plutonium production. Current stocks of weapon-grade plutonium are barely 150 kilograms. The Indian stockpiles are unsafeguarded weapon grade is around 1,000 kilograms. The, uh, the reactor grade plutonium stockpile, again unsafeguarded, is uh, four to five tons. There are different estimates. So uh, given these realities, uh, I mean, uh, I think Pakistan will continue to produce for some material, but there are limits. It's not that it's going to go on forever, maybe five to seven years. And purely for, as Feroz has mentioned, purely for operational military considerations and the fact that the stockpiles are very low uh, in, uh, to begin with, actually. Um, uh, so that explains why Pakistan is blocking negotiations at the Conference on Disarmament. However, it would be very happy to seek international help in developing a civilian nuclear energy base. And actually, Pakistan had, uh, a, uh, as far back as 2007, uh, they had approved a plan for setting up a parallel nuclear fuel cycle uh, under safeguards. 
so that if Pakistan were to get any uh, civil nuclear deal, it could separate a part of the fuel cycle uh, for military and civilian purposes, as was done in India's case. Well, one of the reasons of uh, Pakistan going the sea base, uh, you know, sea base, the third trial is, you know, just because India is doing it, you got to do it, and it's always the inter-service rivalry. That's a very basic reason that doesn't stand logic. Just the three services want each one of them want their own command anyway. Navy would not be let that back. But more importantly, uh, the sea-based uh, deterrent really provides Pakistan a lot of options that they were not unsaid options. Uh, the Indian uh, coastline, peninsular Indian coastline, is vulnerable. That is the most vulnerable part. The Pakistani land forces cannot make penetrations deeper inside. And therefore, the Navy is the one that can target anywhere along the Indian uh, peninsular coastline, with or without nuclear weapons. So this is the <coughs> ultimate deterrent in their opinion. Uh, submarine-based, uh, you know, cruise missile. Uh, they're not going for nuclear power submarine, but for now they're going for conventional submarine and changing the warheads so that it, they can fit in a cruise missile. And that's what Mansoor explained, and that, that's what the plan is. They may also have a surface uh, so, sort of a system, but there are a large number of, uh, you know, target areas deep, especially in south and eastern side, that are not targetable from Pakistani land bases and Air Force bases. So that's probably the reason that it's only the Navy that can reach. There's something else that, the, that is unsaid about the, the, this kind of sea deterrent. It can target not just India. It can target some other countries as well in the region. Even provide extended deterrence on behalf of some other country rather than shifting real weapon systems into another country, a sea-based deterrent is at sea, it can target anywhere. I'm sure you know what I'm saying. So there are a lot of options that are available with sea-based deterrent going forward. That's my view. You want to say something else? Well, there's a lot that needs to be said. Uh, just one point uh, that I just remembered I should have mentioned in my talk about Chick-4. Pakistan never used the Chinese bomb design as a basis of its own weapon design. The coal test, the first coal test of 1983 was less than half the size of what India tested in 1974, which is around 700 kilograms. The Indian uh, design of 1974 was around 1,400 kilograms, and Chick-4 is around 1,300 kilograms. Uh, I just thought I should just clarify that. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> the assistance that the Chinese gave were supplement, was supplementary in nature. A bomb design did come. It went to both PAC and KRL. And through KRL, it went on to Libya and Iran and North Korea and possibly elsewhere. Uh, there were more advanced designs that were found uh, on, the, on the network. Uh, I don't know if they were Pakistani designs or not. I have uh, my own theory on that, but I'd rather not talk about it. Uh, talking about sea-based deterrence, I think Indian the, the development of India's ballistic missile, and you will find out very soon that the Indians are also planning a cruise missile defense. So when you have these plans on the other side, then the military industrial complex says, okay, let's go for something on, on our side as well. This is an arms race of maybe not a classical arms race on the Cold War type, but it is an arms race. And it's about resources and money and power and prestige. Uh, and it provides more rationale and more need for continuing to ramp up plutonium production. And of course, inter-service rivalry, very, very important to each because there are three strategic force commands and the Naval, Naval Strategic Force Command was recently inaugurated uh, in May 2012. Uh, and 
I think both India and Pakistan are actually following the Cold War model. We are relearning or re, uh, you know, we are re, uh, rediscovering Cold War doctrines and terminologies in South Asia after 50 years. So in a way, we are trying to emulate um, what the superpowers did during the Cold War. And in doing so, a naval triad is seen as uh, the symbol of an assured second strike capability. Uh, I don't know if that is designed to provide extended deterrence to a third friendly country. There is talk about that. Uh, there has been talk about that. I don't think Pakistan will ever do, ever provide extended deterrence to Saudi Arabia uh, for the very simple reason that Pakistan has a large Shia minority which is deeply entrenched in its power structure. And they will never allow this to happen. And it, it, and it will be very divisive, very, very dangerous for uh, the stability of the country domestically as well. So even if, hypothetically speaking, Pakistan were to obtain a couple of hundred billion dollars, though that money is going to run out in a decade's time. So then what? And then you would have Iran as an enemy. Iran is a, uh, at the moment is a competitor, is, a, is not a friend but a competitor. And then it would also, uh, no country would want to have two hostile nuclear capable states on both sides. And then there is Afghanistan. There are competing interests that Pakistan and Iran have in Afghanistan, in Central Asia, in, uh, in the Arabian Sea. There is the question of Gwadar port and the uh, Iranian ports as the, which one of them would be the shortest route to Central Asia. Uh, and the reason why uh, such stories have been published recently, the debate has been generated is that because of Pakistan's close ties with Saudi Arabia, um, it is generally believed that the Saudis helped Pakistan. They helped us in times of crisis in terms of oil, um, uh, deferred oil payments, but there is no evidence to suggest that they bankrolled Pakistan's nuclear program. There is no credible evidence that suggests that. And I can go more into detail if, if required. Mike, so with the ret ret retirement of this, uh, I call it the old guard in, in the, the Pakistani military, what do you foresee the uh, the new guard uh, in, in, in terms of how they're going to conduct business? Is it going to be business as usual? Are we going to see significant changes? Uh, will the new guard be uh, less pro-Western than maybe the old guard was? Just your, your thoughts on that. Well, it'll be business as usual, in my assessment, which means that the uh, projects that are already in the pipeline will continue. It is an institutional thing, you see. I think there are a couple of things that have happened which probably just went sort of unnoticed. The Pakistani National Command Authority ordinance was initiated during the emergency of one and a half month that was, uh, you know, that was announced by General Musharraf from November 3rd, 2007 to December 15, 2007. Two days before the emergency was lifted, on 13th December 2007, he introduced an ordinance called NCA, National Command Authority Ordinance. It took three years in Pakistan to actually convert that ordinance into an act, which is legislation of this act. Now that legislation of the act made the Chairman Joint Chief of Staff Committee of Pakistan Armed Forces to be in charge of the Development Control Committee of the country. Up until that time, there used to be uh, Strategic Plans Division, the Old Guard, as you mentioned, was directly reaching out to the Prime Minister, directly reaching out to the President, Musharraf, who was wearing both Army Chief as well as Presidential hat. So the Army Headquarter and the Presidency became a very powerful, direct, you know, uh, you know um, authority to direct the program whatever the strategic plans division did. During my time, we had this luxury. We could think about. But somehow or the other, this luxury changed after 2010 when it was legislated. The chairman joint chief of staff started asserting more authority than was publicly known. So the strategic plans division was not as freed up to go and reach the prime minister, et cetera. They had to go through this channel. But because he, this old guard had been in position so and he was so senior and retired and wearing CVs so people used to respect his opinion 
a lot more. Even the chairman who was technically junior to him in the military service, but otherwise an authority was senior to him, would defer to his judgment. Now what's going to happen is that you're going to have a genuine uh, sort of a junior strategic commander as DG SPD to the chairman joint chief of staff. So this means the change would be that Pakistani chairman joint chief of staff, not only the army chief, the chairman joint chief of staff will have much more teeth than any time in history since it was ever created. And he's the one who's going to be calling the shots on the nuclear and strategic issues now. So that's the going forward is going to be a major visible change, which means more military dominated system rather than that, uh, rather than the civilian control system. And I'm a little bit critical of this whole system because <coughs> this system, as it is evolving going forward now, would have even lesser and lesser civilian oversight in my assessment because of this. So it is going to be really entrenched chairman joint chief of staff. So they do the policy, which is approved by the civilian government. They do the strategy. They do the development plans. They do the nuclear security. They also do the tactical things, operational things as well. They also do the nuclear diplomacy because they have to, you know, approve everything that happens or not. And think tanks. And think tanks, they actually control think tanks a lot more in Islamabad as well as nuclear energy, which is not their expertise. The headquarter of strategic plans division is military. Every person is there is a military officer. The brigadiers and the people of my rank and others are there in that place. And they have some limitation, and I'm saying this with candor here. There are other areas where the civilians have thinking, diplomacy. This is the domain that belongs, the, that civilian government needs to really put it in, them, in, in their right, entrenched in their decision-making process. So there is going to be an evolution of civil versus military decision-making process. In my assessment, that has not evolved as yet because it, it began in the military-dominated system and it's going to get even more and more. So going forward, this is where our discussion with Pakistani authorities should be focused in my assessment. They're going to be pro-Western, I can tell you that, the leadership, that I know. This man who was taken over was a defense attache in UK for a very long time in the rank of brigadier. And he's very, to my knowledge, I know him, he's very uh, outgoing, he's very outward, he's not, he's not a, He's not a loony, I can tell you that. He's a very <laughs> smart guy. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, sir, final word? Well, if civilian control was something that the founding fathers of the nuclear program had envisaged as early as the 1970s, uh, unfortunately, how things happened uh, in the 1990s and then after the 98 tests, uh, the military took over because there was a vacuum. Uh, in my opinion, the vacuum still exists in some way because civilian capacity in policy making uh, still needs to go a long way. Not that the military is really trained or attuned in the art of nuclear strategy and diplomacy, uh, but in the current circumstances, it's going to take a, maybe a decade or more before a mix of a civilian and military control as it, is, as, as it looks on paper uh, if you look at the NCA chart, that actually comes into, into being uh, on ground. Uh, but it's an evolutionary process. It's a slow, painful process, and it has its downsides also. But there is no other alternative. Uh, we'll have to live, up, live with it for a couple of years. Thank you. I'd like to thank our guests and thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, this is a story that I think we're going to continue to track uh, <laughs> very closely. Uh, so uh, thank you, Feroz. Thank you, Mansoor. <laughs> and thank you. And do stay tuned uh, because uh, CGSR is lining up uh, its next round of, uh, of speakers for you. And if you have ideas, uh, suggestions, input, we're, uh, We'd like to hear it. So thank you, and uh, that will conclude our session for today. Feroz is going to stick around for those of you that have books that need to be signed.